Okay, our first speaker uh, this morning comes to us from Missoula, Montana. <clears throat> really, really appreciate Mark. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly how to describe Mark in terms of familial relationship, but anyhow, his mom is my wife, so you figure out how that works. <laughs> but I, I really appreciate Mark. Uh, you know, I first met him in uh, Pleasant Hill, Oregon years ago when he was just a young guy. When as soon as he graduated from high school, he started occupying basement space at our place, and and uh, I just always appreciate the interrelationship that he and you know my kids have had, and uh, but I really also appreciate the fact that he's a really excellent preacher. <clears throat> you know, I've got to hear Mark preach all around the country, and he he's preached some tremendous messages, and uh, so I'm just excited to have him come and speak to us this morning. So come on, Mark. Give him a big hand. Thanks, pal. <clears throat> hey, gang, good morning. Everybody got your breakfast in you or whatever you, you had your opportunity. Now it's too late. <clears throat> Turn to Proverbs chapter 30. I remember some of those some of those times we'd uh, <clears throat> at the at the time and the time now would be about uh, uh, mm, boy that'd have to be about thirty two thirty four somewhere years ago. Um, <clears throat> Jay'd be making his uh, his his western tour at, at the time, and and we lived in the Eugene Springfield area, and so he'd come down and and uh, you know through a friend of a friend we heard that there's this preacher who was coming through town, and <clears throat> well, well I've got to check that out, so we'd uh, we'd stop in and and go see and <clears throat> find out what was happening, and, and well, I'll tell you there's just you know you you'd uh, he preached. He preached differently, and um, you know, as somebody who actually knew what they were talking about, uh, not just like your typical scribe, and uh, and that was that was appealing um, to us as a family and, and to me personally, and and um, so I was I was grateful for that for that introduction, and um, really thankful for the peaks and what the what the peaks has been. Um, Again, for me individually, uh, over so many years, I, I can't remember um, when I first got here. I think it was 90 or 91, something like that. Um, but uh, you know, it just made a huge, a huge difference for me individually. In um, it was, it was at the at the peaks that uh, you know I, I um, was uh, desperately asking. Cliff Renner one year, hey, uh, <clears throat> you think you've got a spot at, at Quick Copy Printing for uh, for a, a transplant from Oregon? And um, Cliff made a uh, made a space for me at the time. See, I knew Matt Wilson, and uh, um, uh, Matt said, hey, I'm I'm going to leave Quick Copy and uh, and uh, attend college in the fall. And he said, you know, there might be an, might be an opening there. <clears throat> so it was at the peaks that I said, hey. You know, Mr. Renner, would you uh, would you mind if I if I filled that spot? And uh, Luke was headed off to to uh, parts unknown, and so <clears throat> that meant there might be some more basement space. So <clears throat> Jay and Lana were kind enough to let me, uh, like he said, uh, occupy some of their some of their basement, a tradition which I hear still lives on. Uh, so <clears throat> good for them, <clears throat> but. You know, it's really those couple of things that um, that that allowed me um, and encouraged me to make the decisions that I made. And so, um, but the the long term difference of you know that those things make the the trajectory change. You know, at, at that point in life, uh, I'm very very grateful for. And um, you know, if all of these uh, all these rascally kids who are carving and digging and, you know, <clears throat> all the things that they do. Uh, just really appreciate them being here. 
I appreciate you know you older fellows making the space for those guys. In a lot of ways, Peaks is as much or more for them than it is for you. So uh, just really, really grateful for that. Talking with Mitchell last night um, and uh, just about some of those younger guys and the, the focus that they have and what's on their minds and that's exciting to me. So <clears throat> really appreciate your being here. I think this year maybe even a little more than usual. Uh, fellowship is, is, is that much more necessary and certainly that much more sweet. Proverbs chapter 30, <clears throat> verse 29. <clears throat> he says, There are three things which are stately in their march, even four which are stately when they walk, the lion which is mighty among beasts and does not retreat before any, the strutting cock, the male goat also, and a king when his army is with him. Hmm, let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, <clears throat> Lord, uh, your majesty is enthroned above the heavens. <clears throat> Father, uh, when, uh, when you consider what is man, um, that you would even take thought of him, Lord, seems perhaps strange to us. And yet, <clears throat> you've made him for a little while lower than the angels, that, uh, uh, that he might be exalted forever uh, above them. Father, we're grateful that um, we get to be here this morning. So thankful, Father, for the, uh, the sunshine. Really grateful for the opportunity to talk about your word this morning, encourage one another. And Father, we pray that, uh, that the speakers, myself included, would do justice to the scriptures. Lord, we want to be able to, uh, uh, to encourage and <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to build our faith. Uh, Father, we also pray that uh, just this weekend and, uh, uh, and our time together would really be delightful to you. Father, we pray that you are pleased in those things and, and that, uh, that it's a joy for you that, uh, uh, that your word is spoken and that, uh, uh, and that we get to encourage each other and build up the body for which you've died. Lord, we pray that uh, you'd watch over us to that effect this morning. Father, may you be glorified in all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> There's just something about, you know, you got to get the Nature Channel or something to watch those strutting lions across the African savanna. <clears throat> There's no, he fears no one and nothing, right? <clears throat> the, uh, the rooster fears nothing either just because he knows no better. <clears throat> the he-goat has a, has a fairly reasonable claim to that kind of confidence. <clears throat> and a king before his army, right? <clears throat> nothing can stop him. Nothing can stop him. He, he, is, he is supremely confident, right. <clears throat> at least before the battle. <clears throat> We're going to talk about uh, Daniel's chapter, chapters 4 and 5 today, um, which is uh, Daniel chapter 4 is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of, uh, of the great tree <clears throat> and the resulting humility that God subjected on him. Daniel chapter 5 is the, is the record of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, uh, Belshazzar, who, uh, who foolishly used the temple vessels to toast his own gods. So, but in both cases, kings, and in both cases, I mean, rulers of the entire world at that time, uh, by God's own uh, um, analysis, he said, there's nothing that, that you can't do. He said, you know, your kingdom is spread to everywhere. It's over the, the entire earth. <clears throat> Daniel, in talking to Belshazzar, says, your grandfather, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, he said he did whatever he wanted to. Whom he killed, he killed. Whom he left alive, he left alive. <clears throat> Whom he raised up or brought down, he did so. He did whatever he chose. <clears throat> but God wanted to make clear and did make clear to all those ancient kings... <clears throat> to anybody who was listening and some who weren't, <clears throat> that there is a God in the heavens whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, whose kingdom will not be given to another, and to whom all the kings of the earth must answer. And God made that clear through the ancient world. <clears throat> From the very beginning, right, as soon as... Uh, as soon as mankind gets off the ark, <clears throat> it seems that, that, uh, that 
somebody had the bright idea, <clears throat> you know what we need to do is we need to build a tower to heaven. Right? <clears throat> because we're, we're going to build a tower up to the place that belongs to God. That's what we're going to do. <clears throat> and a lot of those, it, it would seem, a lot of the ancient ziggurats that have been built across the globe are really the, the results <clears throat> of that initial tower or the, or the reincarnations of that tower. <clears throat> and the Lord looked down and says from heaven, <clears throat> and he saw what they were doing, that they were one nation and one people. He said nothing will be impossible for them. <clears throat> and so he decided on a little plan of his own. He said, <clears throat> I'm just going to confuse their languages, right? And so the result was <clears throat> the nations were formed because people were divided <clears throat> by their language groups <clears throat> and work on the tower ceased. But if those guys were paying attention, say, no, <clears throat> God stopped that thing and demonstrated to all of them that he's a king that rules over all mankind, all kingdoms. <clears throat> Somewhat later, <clears throat> another, another empire grew. And the empire of, of Egypt grew strong, largely through the influence of Joseph. Um, you know, Joseph, the, uh, the Hebrew kid, refugee thrown down to Egypt as a slave, <clears throat> uh, Joseph uh, really was instrumental in amassing all of the wealth of the entire region in Egypt. When he goes through a, a systematic, um, <clears throat> though it wasn't compulsory, um, Joseph was, was clever enough <clears throat> that by the end of those seven years of famine, which he had predicted um, through, the, um, through the Pharaoh's dream, by the end of those years of famine, Joseph has taken control of all the liquid assets. He's taken control of all the means of capital. Joseph has taken control of all the property so that he has reduced to serfdom all of the surrounding peoples. And Egypt is the power in the land. And Egypt grew, of course, in power and subjected the Hebrews until Moses. And then God made it quite clear to the Egyptians who was God. You know, the, uh, <clears throat> the ten plagues, as you know, and Exodus brings this out, the ten plagues are really the judgments against the gods that the Egyptians worshipped, step by step by step. <clears throat> so what? So that they would know that there is a God see, in the heavens to whom all kings must bow the knee and all kings must confess that he is Lord whether now or later. <clears throat> it didn't take too long after that, but that the Assyrian Empire rose to power. There's some in between, but <clears throat> the Assyrians, you know, a great powerful empire, not particularly long-lived, <clears throat> but certainly powerful. The Assyrians controlled most all of that region. <clears throat> and one might even, one might even if they were not a close observer, they might think that the Assyrians <clears throat> had gained power over Israel too. The Assyrians came down, if you recall, from kind of the north and uh, they conquered all of, of uh, the northern nation of Israel, the ten tribes that had split away uh, under the rule of Solomon's son Rehoboam, <clears throat> conquered them, took them off, and they were never heard from again. They made quite a good incursion into Judah as well, conquering most of all the cities of Judah. <clears throat> and then in the words of Sennacherib, he, he caged Hezekiah, that's the king at Jerusalem, in his city like a bird. <clears throat> and he made this boast. You know, he sent his, he sent his, uh, his flunky out, <clears throat> Rabshakeh, to go and, and speak to the people in Jerusalem. He says, you know, do you think that your God is going to be able <clears throat> to protect you, to save you? Do you think your God... Now listen. Fellas, we're all friends here, right? We're speaking your language. <clears throat> Listen, we know. I mean, what happened to all the gods of those other nations that we just mowed through? <clears throat> Let's make a deal. Let's be reasonable here, shall we? <clears throat> because no God's going to save you from my hand. Well, <clears throat> Hezekiah and uh, some of his advisors, they took that letter, <clears throat> took it before the Lord, and the Lord said, well, not for your sake, but because of my own sake, he said, I'm going to make sure that, that uh, <clears throat> the Assyrians learn a lesson that they will never forget. 
and they did. <clears throat> um, when the next morning, 185,000 of the Assyrian army were dead outside the walls of Jerusalem, Sennacherib decided to go home. <clears throat> kings of the earth, take notice, there is a God in the heavens <clears throat> to whom all kings must bow. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. <clears throat> the Babylonians rose to power, <clears throat> a colony kind of of the Assyrian Empire. Babylon, first a small city, <clears throat> as it's situated there on kind of the Euphrates and the, and the Tigris River, <clears throat> was a natural um, a natural strategic point in trading for that region and as such the city grew and it became very prominent and really it became a, a picture of the world. I think one of the fellows brought that out last night. Just tremendously wealthy, <clears throat> the commerce, uh, glory, magnificence. Uh, Babylon was like nothing I've ever seen and, and that's just what I get from reading about it. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the Babylonians came to power and uh, I don't know if somebody's going to talk about it, uh, so I, I won't uh, give you too much information. But, you know, right from the beginning, the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem beginning in about 610 B.C. And they finally, finally finished the job in 586, <clears throat> destroyed the temple, burned it to the ground, you know, took off all of the, um, anybody who was worth taking, they took to Babylon. And so someone, if they weren't a careful observer, might look at that event historically and think that the Babylonian gods were greater than the gods of Israel. They might think that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, Yahweh was worshipped by the Jews, see, had been overcome by the Babylonian gods. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> God made it clear to the Babylonians who was God. So <clears throat> when, uh, when those pesky Hebrews wouldn't bow down and worship the statue. And the king said, throw them into the furnace of fire. <clears throat> the result of that is, hey, nobody bad mouths the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? How come? Because <clears throat> no other God can save that way. I mean, in the midst of this most glorious of all the world kingdoms, which is how you know, the statue describes it, you, O king, are the head of gold. After that, there'll be another kingdom inferior to yours. But the greatest of all world kingdoms <clears throat> was Babylon. It was the most glorious of all. <clears throat> Rome is just iron by comparison. <clears throat> but inside Babylon, it happens, with, uh, it happens with the Hebrews in the fiery furnace. <clears throat> it happens with Daniel when he, uh, um, when he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. <clears throat> And uh, then the Lord takes a special interest in him. It would happen somewhat slightly less for the Persians. Daniel also was an advisor to Darius the Mede, the first of that Medo-Persian empire. <clears throat> uh, Daniel recognized who the God of heaven was, <clears throat> and the Persians uh, recognized Daniel. Um, they'd also, some, uh, Cyrus, for example, <clears throat> the Persian emperor, is anticipated by the scriptures. <clears throat> I think Cyrus knew that and accomplished all God's purpose, including letting the Jews return to Jerusalem. <clears throat> In the days of the Roman kings and their gods, <clears throat> God also let all the nations know who was God. Because right? he said there was a time <clears throat> in ignorance in Acts 17 where God allowed, in essence, the nations to kind of go their way. All right, But now he's declaring to all men everywhere that they should repent, having fixed a day right, in which he will judge the world, having furnished proof through a man whom he has appointed by raising him from the dead. <clears throat> the message of Jesus Christ went out to all the Roman Empire so that all the world would know that there is a God who has dominion over the whole world and to whom every man and every king must ultimately give obeisance. Mankind is kind of thick, have you noticed? I mean, it's a little bit slow on the uptake sometimes. <clears throat> but God is patient. <clears throat> God is patient. <clears throat> These kings who thought that they were all that and a bag of chips, <clears throat> God didn't leave them um, without witness. Um, even the prophets <clears throat> in Isaiah, <clears throat> excuse me, 
<clears throat> chapters about 9 through 34 do not primarily look at Israel. <clears throat> they look at all the surrounding nations. <clears throat> it's woe to you and woe to you and woe to you and woe to you. <clears throat> because God's keeping track of what's going on in the nations. God watches, God knows, and God repays them, <clears throat> and he repays their kings. Turn to, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see, let's go to First Chronicles. <clears throat> I know we've got a full schedule this morning, so I'm going to try and be <clears throat> as, as uh, succinct as possible. First Chronicles chapter 21, <clears throat> beginning in verse 9. <clears throat> David, has, uh, David did a foolish thing. <clears throat> David numbered all the people of Israel. Now, he was commanded not to do that. <clears throat> because God didn't want Israel fighting the battles that they thought they could win. He wanted Israel fighting the battles that ought to be fought because they were right. <clears throat> so David has numbered the people. He wants to know <clears throat> what the strength of his army is. And that was displeasing to the Lord. So in verse 9, the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, and he said, Go speak to David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Oh, good. <clears throat> Choose for yourself one of them that I may do it to you. Not so good. So Gad came to David and he said to him, Thus says the Lord, take for yourself either A, three years of famine, or B, three months to be swept away before your foes, or C, <clears throat> the Lord will destroy throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Oh, that's, that's you have no good choices there, right? <clears throat> A, <clears throat> you can have you can have what was it? You have uh, three months of uh, three years of famine. <clears throat> B is three months that your enemies are going to put the whooping on you. <clears throat> or C, the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel for three days. Hmm, <clears throat> not an easy question. Let me think about that. Three years of famine, three months of defeat, or three days of the Lord's justice. Ah! <clears throat> and David chooses wisely. <clears throat> he says, I'll take the three days of the Lord because at least the Lord might be merciful to me. <clears throat> famine or <clears throat> famine, and my enemies <clears throat> won't show me any mercy, but perhaps the Lord will. <clears throat> and so he says, I'll choose the Lord, thanks. <clears throat> and, uh, and he was right to do so. <clears throat> but I want you to notice, David, see, David is going to be brought to account <clears throat> by the Lord. And it wouldn't be the only time that God does that with David. But God is the one <clears throat> who punishes... Thanks, pal. God is the one who punishes <clears throat> kings. God is the one who makes sure that nations understand who God is. He has, <clears throat> since the days of Christ, done that <clears throat> through the mechanism of the church. <clears throat> who are really <clears throat> form the, the, uh, his present-day prophets. Not latter-day prophets, pre present-day. I just thought I'd make that clear. <clears throat> now let's get to Daniel chapter 4. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 4, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar. The king to all the peoples, nations, men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. That is the emperor of the world speaking when Nebuchadnezzar says he is the king. That is, the God Most High is the king. <clears throat> and Nebuchadnezzar then went on to have a dream. He dreamed, <clears throat> if I may paraphrase, he dreamed of a great tree. And the tree had grown up and it was luxurious and enormous. <clears throat> and it was so large, it stretched nearly to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> and every, every critter you know, of, of wing and foot came and sought shelter and found space underneath the shade of that tremendous tree. <clears throat> all, over, all over the world, it's mighty and strong. 
And then he said there was an angelic watcher. <clears throat> and he said, cut it down. And so <clears throat> they cut it down, and this tree falls. <clears throat> and, said, and then bind it with a, with a band <clears throat> of iron and bronze. Ra wrap it around, <clears throat> keep it in check. But don't take the roots out, leave the roots in it, <clears throat> leave the stump, and it'll come back. <clears throat> well, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know what in the world that means. <clears throat> and so he searches throughout the kingdom. And of course, I don't know why they never asked Daniel first. It seems like they always, you know, call in the conjurers and bring in the wise men. And <clears throat> I don't know if you had to move up the appellate wise man chain to get to Daniel or but of course they throw up their hands oh I don't know what this means they have no idea so uh, he tells the dream to Daniel and uh, Daniel says okay verse 19 of chapter 4 Daniel whose name is Belteshazzar was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him <laughs> you know that's like that's like when the dentist is looking at your x-rays and he doesn't speak for a moment that's a bad thing <clears throat> uh, <laughs> the king responded and said, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Uh, <laughs> Belteshazzar answered, he said, My lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. <clears throat> you, have, uh, you have stage four pride. And um, <clears throat> you, you have not long to, not long to, to persist. But I... I'm going to give you a, a treatment plan here. The tree which you saw in verse 20, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. And it's you, O king. You're the tree. You've become great, grown strong. Your majesty has become great, and reached to the sky, and your dominion to the end of the earth. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven, saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground and with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king that you be driven away from mankind, your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field, and you be given grass to eat like cattle, and drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you, until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and bestows it on whomever he wishes. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you, after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O King, May my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. Daniel said, O king, <clears throat> you are in it now, buddy. <clears throat> he said, the Most High has declared <clears throat> that he's chopping your tree down. <clears throat> he said, he's gonna, he's gonna, you'll be cast out from mankind. Furthermore, it's going to lose your sovereign mind. Come on, right? I'm never you, Chad Nezer. You can't do that to me. And his response is, is not noted here, but he had enough faith in Daniel. How would you like to be the guy who's going to call Nebuchadnezzar to repentance? Listen, I don't know what you're going to do, Nebuchadnezzar, but if I was you, I'd be looking to change my ways, right? He says, you might even prolong it if you just, you know, if you just do right, if you, you know, try and take care of the poor, turn from your iniquities, stop doing stupid, you know, <clears throat> maybe, maybe the Lord will, will allow you. And it's going to be about a year, actually. He had about a year to think it over. <clears throat> One day, Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> walking on the palace roof, surveying all of his grandeur, all of the city which he has made, and all of the tremendous things that he has done, and what a really spectacular guy he is, and bam, I mean, just right now, the words had not hardly escaped his lips, right? <clears throat> Who is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself has built, and a royal residence by the might of my power, 
and for the glory of my majesty. While the word, the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven. That's it. It's over. And king Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. And that's what happened. Nebuchadnezzar lost his mind <clears throat> and was driven out from mankind. This is, uh, this is amazing to me. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, the, the greatest of all the emperors, arguably, who, who ever ruled, <clears throat> is thrown out. And, and nobody bothers to take a pot shot at him. I mean, I don't know if he was in the <clears throat> king protection program or what happened to him, but he's out in the field, you know, What's that behind the rock? Oh, that's Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> don't, don't worry about him. He's, he's kind of creeping around. No, he just does that. He's fine. <clears throat> he's fine. What's he chewing on? That's grass. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Who was he? Oh, he's, uh, that's Nebuchadnezzar the king. Yeah, we just keep him over there in that part of the yard. <clears throat> you know, drenched. You know, he's out there. <sighs> he's like Gollum. You know, he's out there sneaking around on the rocks and chewing on stuff and his nails grew long and his hair's all matted. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> he's fine. He's fine. <clears throat> but the Lord preserves him for what, uh, what they call seven periods of time. Um, Halley's believes that the, that, uh, the Babylonians had two seasons, kind of like we do, winter and road construction. <clears throat> and, so, and so it's, it's possible, though, uh, though I can't say with certainty, that the, span, the time span here is three and a half years, maybe seven years, depending on <clears throat> how, uh, how that, depending on what periods of time that refers to. But what's even more amazing to me is that at the end of that period of time, Nebuchadnezzar regains his faculty. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, again, regains his sovereign mind. At the end of that period, this is verse 34, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My reason returned to me. I blessed the Most High, praised and honored Him who lives forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to His will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off His hand or say to Him, Why have you done this? At that time, my reason returned to me. This actually is really quite profound on another level. <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. No one has a sovereign mind who does not really recognize that there is a God who reigns in heaven. Nebuchadnezzar is just the full-scale illustration of, that, uh, of, of the, the process that takes place, which Romans describes when someone is unwilling to recognize God, they eventually, t they eventually are reduced to unreasoning animal. And Nebuchadnezzar is a great picture of that. My reason returned to me, my majesty, my splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out and I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. And I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt and honor the king of heaven for all his works are true, his ways are just, he's able and humble to, able to humble those who walk in pride. <clears throat> what a tremendous thing that was. And that's one thing for a guy to lose his mind. <clears throat> For God to be able to bring Nebuchadnezzar back to that position of authority, I mean, nobody wants to take a pot shot at the king. I mean, who's been ruling in, the, in those intervening seven periods of time? You suppose they're anxious to see the return of Nebuchadnezzar? <clears throat> you suppose in Babylon, you suppose it's only in, you know, only in our world that there's corruption at the highest levels of power? And to be able to bring Nebuchadnezzar back... <clears throat> I mean, you can almost hear the, the mudslinging at the campaign. This guy was crazy for seven periods of time. You can't trust him with your economy. <clears throat> I mean, how, does, how does that work, right? And yet, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar is restored to power. That, I think, is a greater miracle <clears throat> than the previous one. His nobles sought him out, but Nebuchadnezzar learned something. He learned <clears throat> that he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4 describes Jesus' temptation. <clears throat> and I want to just look at, at one. In verse 5, The devil took him up into the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written. He'll give his angels charge concerning you, 
and on their hands they'll bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. There are three categories of sin, <clears throat> the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And putting the Lord to the test is the third. It's, <clears throat> it's the boastful pride of life. It's putting God to the test. <clears throat> Lord, I did this. You must do that. <clears throat> Some of you guys, you know, play cards, and uh, in some of those card games, you have to do what's follow suit, right? <clears throat> you, you guys know if that means if if somebody plays a spade, you got to play a. Okay, so yeah, there's about five of you who know how to play cards, <clears throat> right? If they play a heart, you got to play a heart. That's that's you got to follow suit, right? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> he'll bear his, you know, he'll give his angels charge concerning you. On their hands they'll bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So, stone. so Jesus, why don't you take a leap off the pinnacle of the temple here and don't sweat it because right, he's already given his angels charge concerning you, so you're good. You're golden, right? You got a golden parachute here. You, you're not going to hit the ground. This is fantastic. <clears throat> you can force God's hand. Now, side so note, uh, it doesn't work out that way in, in practice. Israel thought one time they were going out to battle against their perennial enemies, the Philistines. <clears throat> and so they got defeated at first and they thought, oh no, what will we do? Oh, somebody had the bright idea. I know what we'll do. <clears throat> Let's go get the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, and we'll take it into battle with us. Yeah, right? And then the Lord will have to fight for us. Yeah, that's a great idea. And so they did. They went and they grabbed the ark and they carried it out there and they tooted their horns and the Philistines said, uh-oh, here come the Israelites. They've got the box. <clears throat> that's right, we've got the box. You're in trouble now. And the Philistines said, well, man up, Philistines. Come on, they've got the box. You're going to have to work harder today. And not only did Israel lose the battle, they lost the box. Now, the Philistines gave it back. <clears throat> but you're not going to put God to the test and say, Lord, I did this. Now, you're going to have to follow suit. You're going to have to step up to the plate because I played a spade, Lord, and you're going to have to play a spade. <clears throat> the Lord doesn't do tricks. The Lord doesn't do tricks. <clears throat> You're not a Coke machine that you put in your quarters and you make your decision and say, Lord, that's what I want. <clears throat> the ark was never in any danger. <clears throat> the ark can take care of itself. Right? Uh, <clears throat> Israel learned an important lesson. You can't put God to the test. Now, <clears throat> well, we would never take the ark into battle. I mean, <laughs> that's crazy talk. <clears throat> we wouldn't do that. But might we try to force the Lord's hand? Lord, this is what I'm going to do. <clears throat> and you're just going to have to come along for the ride. You're just going to have to cover me, Lord. <clears throat> this, is what I, this is what I'm going to do. <clears throat> and Lord, you're just going to have to fill in the gaps. The boastful pride of life isn't, <clears throat> isn't anything you don't know about. Boastful pride of life is when you make a decision, <clears throat> say, well, the Lord's just going to have to make it work, I guess. When you've got to make choices about what to do and where to go, when, you, when you've got to make decisions <clears throat> about, okay, well, what are we going to do about school? What are we going to do? Where are we going to live here? <clears throat> I've got a job opportunity in Pango Pango and it pays really well. There's no congregation there. Lord, you're going to have to cover me. <clears throat> I, I, I there's a, you know, I guess the Lord's just going to have to, just going to have to fill in the gaps. Lord's just going to have to, because I'm there. So, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> Should we continue in sin that grace may increase? Lord, you're just going to have to cover me. Right? I mean, I'm going to do my thing. Yes, I'm going to try, of course, but, <clears throat> but Lord, you're just going to have to. You're just going to have to make up, the, make up the difference. I played a spade. Lord, I guess you're going to have to play a spade too. 
the Lord's not going to be pushed into any of that stuff. <clears throat> the Lord gives you a way of, of, of escape in, in temptation. You know, hanging out there is just putting the Lord to the test. If you don't take it, don't take the way of escape. <clears throat> Lord, I, uh, and it could be, you know, I don't want to bore you with examples and details, but you can fill in the blanks here, right? Okay. <clears throat> Lord, you're just going to have to make it work. Uh, no. Mm -mm. You're dragging the Lord into some battle you ought not be fighting in the first place. <clears throat> Lord's not going along with that. The second... Uh, the second illustration, or the second thing I want to talk about is out of Daniel 5. The Lord is able to humble those who walk in pride. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6 bring this out in the New Testament. <clears throat> and He's able to exalt those who are humble. He's about to do some more humbling to Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. Belshazzar, like too many sons of greater fathers, does not appreciate the lessons that Nebuchadnezzar learned. <clears throat> and so, as he is enjoying the fruits and the glories of his sires, toasting his gods, the Babylonian gods, by the way, were just the latest incarnations <clears throat> of the gods of the Canaanites, the, they call them Bel, or it's a different form of Baal, <clears throat> Marduk and the rest. When, uh, when he's in, the, in his palace here, Belshazzar in chapter 5, verse 1, Belshazzar, the king, holds a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. He is drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. And when Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem in order that the kings and his nobles, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. <clears throat> They're having a killer party. He's got a thousand people there. I mean, they've got everything from, you know, dancing bears to you name it. They've got it all at this party. There's a thousand of his nobles and people everywhere and everybody's having a good time and the wine is flowing freely and the king says, you know what this party really needs? Those gold vessels. You guys go get those vessels. And so Nebuchadnezzar had carried away, as he refers to here, all those golden vessels from the, from the temple of the Lord, from the temple that Solomon had built. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar had carried all that stuff away, brought it to Babylon, and stored it. It would eventually find its way back, but <clears throat> he's got it there. Belshazzar, the little twit, says, you know what we ought to do? We ought to get out those gold vessels that Granddad pulled out from Jerusalem. We ought to drink from those. Why do you suppose he wants to do that? That's a good question, isn't it? <clears throat> Does the wine taste different? I mean, do you suppose he was drinking out of, uh, what was he, using Tupperware in the meantime? I mean, he, he's the king after all, Belshazzar. He, <clears throat> he's, does he have a, a Nalgene bottle that he's drinking out of? What's he, what's he got? I'm pretty confident he's drinking out of gold already, right? So what's the point of dragging those out? You know what it is? Just to do it. Just to do it, man. <clears throat> I'm just going to do it. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. Just to do it, man. <clears throat> right? They don't fear. They don't fear angelic majesties. Just to do it. I'm just going to do it. Because I can. Get those gold vessels out of the treasury. Bring them out here. Let's fill them up and let's use them. huh? We're going to toast our gods <clears throat> with the vessels that belong to Yahweh. We're going we're to toast our gods as if to victory. We're going we're to stick it in the face of God. How about that? <clears throat> and they were in no frame of mind to talk sense either. So they said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And about that time, bam, you know, the hand shows up. And it starts, nothing just but the hand. Right? And it starts marking on the wall. 
And Belshazzar, it's funny, his hips go slack, his knees start knocking together, his face grows pale. Mama! <laughs> That's basically what he does. Because he calls, he calls, <laughs> Mommy. He says, I don't know what to do. Right, this hand, there's a hand on the wall. <clears throat> I don't know what he'd done if there was a spider. <clears throat> there's a hand on the wall, it's marking on the wall. <clears throat> so what is he, well, he calls in all the counselors and the Chaldeans and the wise guys and they all look at the wall and, yep, sure enough, there's something on the wall. Boy, I'm glad I pay you guys. I never see them earn their keep ever in the scriptures. I never see them, yep, this is what it means. Don't need to bring, don't bother Daniel with this one. We got, it. that never happens. He keeps them on the payroll anyway. It's like the Department of Education. I don't know what good they do. They just, they're just on the payroll. <clears throat> so <clears throat> he calls them in. They don't know what to do. Oh, no, what do we, he calls for his mama. She comes, <clears throat> well, listen. There was a long time ago, and your father, Nebuchadnezzar, there was this guy. Sure enough, he's still around. Daniel, still there. They bring him in, right? And he's kind of a crusty old fellow by this point <clears throat> because Belshazzar promises him, or whoever can, whoever can sort this thing out that's on the wall, promises whoever can solve the riddle, I'll give you a purple robe and a big gold chain and make you third in command of the kingdom. And... Daniel's like, I've been here before. <clears throat> Keep it. I, I don't want your gifts. Thanks anyway. Give them to whoever you want. He says, but I'll tell you what it means. Mini, mini, tikal, you farsen. <clears throat> means your kingdom is coming to an end. <clears throat> it means you've been weighed in the scales and you've come up short. And it's going to be given to the Persians. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> well, here's the gifts I promised. Great. <clears throat> Belshazzar's kingdom lasted only a few more hours. That night, <clears throat> the, uh, a force of Mede Persians under the command of Darius had, uh, you know the story. They took the city. They took the city of Babylon, which was an impregnable city. It could not fall. And that's the truth of it. Babylon could not fall. It was only by miracle that Babylon came down. And it did. And it came down in one night, in one hour almost, as it were. <clears throat> and the smoke went up. <clears throat> Belshazzar, of course, was killed. But oddly enough, the Persians decide they're going to keep Daniel around. <clears throat> so Daniel becomes a, an advisor in now the third empire in which he has served. Now he's a Persian, but the Lord looked after Daniel. Belshazzar did something that was foolish, obviously. He decided that he was going to raise himself above God. And, and in doing that, he said, I'm going to take the things that were for God, I'm going to use them for mine, for my own. I'm going to take that which is holy, and I'm going to use it for what's not holy. I'm going to I'm going to take the things that belong to God and I'm going to use them as just common items. Okay. Now, we have a we have a word for that. Um, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll try to get this wrapped up here. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Verse 26 says, If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. <clears throat> Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? We know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's what Belshazzar did. Is He took those things which were holy, regarded them as unclean. He took the things that were 
<clears throat> that were set aside for the Lord, and he used them for his own selfish ends. And the result is, God was not going to let him get away with that. I need more fingers! <clears throat> was not going to let him get away with that. <clears throat> not going to let him affront the God whose dominion is everlasting <clears throat> and to whom all kings must bow. <clears throat> so, he dealt with Belshazzar. <clears throat> but he also deals with anyone else <clears throat> who's going to treat him the same way. One of the things that the Lord was particularly um, insistent on when it came to, uh, when it came to the law uh, and its administration is before the people, he said, I will be treated as holy. And if you broke that command, you did so at the risk of your own life. <clears throat> he said, before the congregation, I will be treated as holy. You will show the appropriate respect. And toasting with those vessels which belong to God <clears throat> was a slap in the face of God. Now, <clears throat> when Hebrews talks about that, using what's clean for unclean purposes, <clears throat> we, have a, we have a Bible word for that, and that word is blasphemy. That's what, it's what the Pharisees did in Matthew 12 <clears throat> when they took what was clean, that is when they regarded Jesus, <clears throat> as unclean, as common. <clears throat> and it's blasphemy, in specific blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is not forgivable. <clears throat> I don't want to get diverted onto that. I just want to keep it in the generality. <clears throat> if you had, I don't know, we have, we have camping gear, right? And we have, we have houseware. Jen got me a, a spatula because my last spatula met its, its unfortunate end <clears throat> uh, when we were camping earlier. And so she picked up a spatula for me <clears throat> and uh, had it all ready to go. I was so thoughtful of her. <clears throat> my spatula out, brand new spatula. Ooh, this is going to be great. I said, yeah, this is a good one. And the head flew off. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so <clears throat> don't worry, boys. This will be fine. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right? <clears throat> You got some vessels, some instruments that are for common use, or we might call it camping use, right? And you notice the, the hygiene levels are significantly decreased while camping, right? Op Kleenex, optional while you're camping. I particularly appreciate that, frankly. <clears throat> Kleenex are optional. You know, napkins, <laughs> well, you, gotta, you need something to start fires with. So... <clears throat> Right, I mean, there's a lot of things that are, the, the level of, uh, the level of mm, sophistication is, is brought down significantly while you're camping, right? <clears throat> yes. I'm done with this spoon. Sure, you can use it. <clears throat> I just brush my teeth. Why not? <laughs> right, you give, that's okay, right? There are things you use for common use, but then there are some things that you don't take camping with you, right? Jen was happy that I took that spatula because it meant that I was leaving other things in her kitchen alone. Right? So there are some things that you don't take camping with you because they're not for common use. <clears throat> you wouldn't take those things and bring them out here with you. <clears throat> you, you wouldn't take your, your, your wife's fine china, if your wife has fine china, and bring that out here, <clears throat> at least at your peril. You have blasphemed. <laughs> That's it. <clears throat> and we would never dream of abusing God's vessels, right? Of, of taking those things which were sanctified and set aside for His use exclusively and using them just for common things, would we? Say no. <clears throat> no, we would not. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, <clears throat> he says in verse, uh, oh, let's 
let's start in verse 21. Doesn't the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he also says in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it will be in that place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of God. <clears throat> he says, doesn't he have a right to make out of the clay what he wants to? And if he wants to make a vessel of mercy prepared for glory, does not the Lord have a right to do that? Yes, he does. <clears throat> and when you look around you, what you ought to see beside you are vessels of mercy prepared beforehand for glory. Now, we'd never take. I mean, Belshazzar is a fool of the greatest magnitude when he thinks that he's going to scoff in the face of God and get away with it. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we ought, to, we ought to add how Paul describes that relationship. <clears throat> he says in verse 6, he says, God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. He said, we have, we have that treasure, the treasure of the light of the gospel of the knowledge of God in the face of Christ. He said, we have that. He said, we have it in earthen vessels. That's these clay vessels, right? Right. <clears throat> now that's greater than anything that the temple vessels ever held. greater than anything that Solomon ever put into one of those pots, bowls, whatever it was, cups. They never held that. Belshazzar, the cups that he used to blaspheme the God of heaven, they never held in them anything close to what resides in you and the person who sits to your right and to your left. And we would never dare to use those cups to toast false gods? This message is a simple one today. <clears throat> it really has two parts. The first part you know, is don't test the Lord. Or we might simplify that by saying love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. <clears throat> and the second part, which is like it, is you know, don't mess with God's vessels. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> for the sake of the one who sanctified them? Simple. Simple. <clears throat> but what God has made holy, regard it as such. We ought not to, to think or to regard any man as in the flesh, right? But as new creatures in Christ. Fellas, I just want to thank you for being here and encourage you. <clears throat> you know, love the Lord and love your neighbor. Thanks very much. Go ahead and stand, guys, and uh, Donnie, why don't you come up here and be my runner again, okay? Okay. Maybe there's somebody here that's got a question or comment on, on Mark's message this morning. Anything anybody wants to add? I really appreciated, you know, a couple of those real great comments that Mark has an opportunity thrown in there. I really like that one, uh, stage four pride. You know, that was, I got to figure out how to steal that one. So, all right, we'll give Mark a big hand. Thank you so Thanks, much. Guys.